pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Amanda Frick, LAC, MD, who holds a doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine, 2009, and a Master's of Traditional Oriental Medicine from Emperor's College of Traditional Oriental Medicine. She combines nine years of clinical practice experience with her varied background in conventional naturopathic and Chinese medicine to help educate and inform others on how to optimize, optimize wellness. Dr. Frick is Thorne's Director of Medical Affairs, where she focuses on driving the creation of medical content for the purposes of education, marketing, and development. Let's give a nice warm welcome to Dr. Amanda Frick. Years, Dr. Frick. All right. Um, so, I just wanted to start by giving you a little mini background. Uh, Joanna, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I actually worked in neurosurgery before I went to naturopathic school. Uh, straight out of undergrad, I was working as a neurophysiologist, so that's where some of my background comes from as well. Um, and from there, I started at SCNM, and after I graduated from SCNM, I added my master's in Chinese medicine. Um, so I had a private practice in Los Angeles for 10 years, and then I went to work for a startup called Harvey Health. We were doing telehealth consultations across the country uh, for naturopathic medicine and integrative testing. And then I actually got this fabulous job at Thorne, which is the best place to work ever. And I'm really happy here. So I'm excited to help share with you how that happens and you know what life looks like between those two spheres and see if I can answer any questions for anyone who'd be interested in sort of pursuing this, this goal or this sort of life, life path. Um, so really, I started with a, a few bullet points, but for me, um, when I finished my education, I didn't expect to be doing anything other than having a private practice. Uh, that was sort of the end goal. I mean, that's mentally the state that you end up in. I think when you're in school of, of what you're supposed to be doing and, and what, how things are done, um, maybe you are in a better place than I was for having planning or thinking about doing something elsewise, um, but I didn't. So I did start my private practice and I, I loved it. I mean, it, it took a long time to build and when I got there, you know, it, it was like it finally happened and it has its own joy for sure. I mean, you're helping people be well and I think that's really important. Uh, but the more people you reach out to, the more it starts to affect you personally and the more it started to sort of take over my personal life. Just checking email at dinner, uh, answering patient calls when I was driving, just constantly having an aspect of, of my personal life that I really wasn't happy with. And I started to get burnt out really bad. Uh, I think this is a medical phenomenon. There's a lot of research coming out in, in general for all facets of medicine and how we're all getting burnt out and you know what do we do about that. Um, but I think I was beyond that and I started reaching out for what some other options were. So for me, um, I did both for a little while. That's sort of my second bullet point about life outside of the office. So I did maintain my clinical practice and started consulting for outside places. So I was consulting for Harvey Health before I left my practice with them. I was helping them design some website content. Uh, I was writing some informational pieces for them. I was also submitting articles to some other websites and other companies that they were using for their blog or using for marketing pieces. Uh, so I kind of played both sides of the coin, which let me back out of some hours of clinical practice. And I probably could have done that for a significant amount of time. That was a good balance for me. But what happened was Harvey got some extra capital funding and decided to expand the company and asked me to come on as their lead naturopathic doctor. And I took a lot of time to think about that because they were asking me to completely leave my practice. Um, the bonus that I got was that because we were going to be running a telehealth uh, company, that I could still give my patients access to me through that venue, and so it worked out. I didn't have to give give everyone away or give up sort of that clinical aspect that they liked. Um, 
So at that point, you know, we were doing that for a while. It's a really difficult business. I feel like I could talk to you about that for an hour. Uh, and decided that the, the stress and hectic startup life was not working and the investors decided that was also not working. So I started looking for different options and I found this position listed at Thorn. Um, so really that's where life started for me in February. I think that um, I never expected to have a job like this, but all of my favorite things about being a naturopath are still encompassed in my position. I can still be working towards making people well every single day, and maybe not in a hands-on scenario, but I know that I, my reach is much larger. You can only see so many people in an office, but thousands of people can take a thorn supplement in, in one hour, uh, and I know that people can get well from this medicine. So really, um, I think I'd like to open it up a little bit because I have some notes here to share about what I think makes sense for people who are interested in being in this profession or kind of going this route to sort of build their resume or build your CV to make you a potential candidate. Because I will share that, um, you know, people do want to work here and they want to work at a lot of other places like this. And I think there's some level of misunderstanding that just because you have an MD degree or an LAC or both or, or multiple degrees that, that you become an expert. And you are, you're an expert in your practice and you're an expert in how you're practicing medicine. It doesn't necessarily contribute to being a corporate employee or for working for an nutraceutical company. And so there are lots of ways that you can sort of build your background to make you be a great candidate if this is something that you're looking at. Um, so before I start that way, how about any questions so far? Anybody have any questions? No, you're on. You're ready to go. Okay. Anybody want to work for Thorne? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. It's a pretty cool place to be. I'll say. So, um, so I actually had a talk with my direct supervisor about what they were looking for when I got this job. Um, we're talking about building an internship program, so we've had this discussion a lot about what makes a good candidate for an intern for our department, which is the medical affairs department. What makes someone a valuable employee for Thorne as far as background, knowledge, and skills? Um, and so I think a way to really start thinking about it is you're already a great doctor, and what are the other skills that you have that are not just being a clinical care practice doctor? Um, some of the things that we would look at would be communication skills is probably number one. Because um, I think probably all of you have met a doctor or two that can't really have a great social engagement outside of their practice setting. Or maybe they get uncomfortable with public speaking. Maybe they aren't great with having conversations with other types of practitioners. Uh, so we're really looking for people who have a wide range of communication skills in a number of settings. So you could maybe be talking at a conference. Maybe you're giving a, a speech at a conference. Maybe you're talking to the procurement director of a really large pharmacy chain. Maybe you're having a discussion with a chief medical officer at a hospital. So those aren't things that everyone's comfortable doing. So you know you can sort of hone those by joining Toastmasters, you can give community lectures, you can just find people that want to talk to you. I'm sure that you guys are all getting driven into your head about having your elevator speech ready, uh, but legitimately just even being able to have a really simple, intelligent conversation with just about anyone uh, is a skill that a lot of people don't have. Uh, so don't, don't underestimate how important that is. Um, Another thing would be generally writing skills. So we do medical education for consumers. We do medical education for practitioners. We do outward facing, inward facing, uh, retail training. And we write blog posts. We contribute to national magazines. And we do a lot of different writing in general. Uh, when I applied for this job, I had to write two pieces. One was a proposed blog piece. Another one was a research extract. Um, both of the pieces that I wrote, they published as soon as the Iron Maid, which is it's kind of amazing. They got some <laughs> work ahead of time from me. 
uh, but you can you know start honing those skills again by fi find someone who will let you write a blog piece. Maybe you get paid for that, maybe you don't, um, but it's still great practice. You can start your own blog. When I applied for the job, I used pieces from my own blog and any other contributions that I made to other people's website, and I created a portfolio of writing pieces. I think that was really helpful. Nothing is too small to start tracking those things now. Um, and then, of course, if you can create a PowerPoint or you're good at creating educational content or organizing content in that way, that's a skill that would lend itself to a medical education department here. Um, if you are not so great at those other aspects, we do have two people on our team that are just customer support facing. So if they're not really taking part in creating medical education, they don't have to do a lot of um, outward facing inner communication other than supporting customers who have questions about products or they're trying to make it order. Um, but we're supporting them from a medical standpoint as well. The other two big things that I think people don't think about that we would look for would be any kind of clinical research skills. It's really hard to come by. Um, someone who really knows how to build a research study or even read one up properly or how to let alone put something together that would be part of building a clinical trial. That would be an amazing skill to have as a, as a background to work at a supplement company. And then any other science kind of background, like lab science, chemistry, biochemistry, anything that could lend your skills to formulation development. Um, I think it's easy to think about you know, what you learn or, or maybe your compounding botanicals at, at the clinic where you're working now, but it's not the same as formulation, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. There even was for me. I could sit down and write down a bunch of things that I think should really go into a formula, but it doesn't mean they work. And there are so many other aspects to that that we don't learn as naturopaths or in school. And so actually having the kind of biochemical knowledge to be able to do something like that, it's, it would be something really amazing. Um, so really, what you can do locally, I need a little list of things that you can do now. And we talked about a lot of it. So you can join Toastmasters, do community lectures, do any kind of writing for other people or yourself. Uh, you can go visit local manufacturers. So knowing about supplements is different than knowing how they're manufactured. Go visit them. Um, my supervisor, or my boss, Jacqueline Jock, she recommended that you would go to Supply Side West, which is the closest place that you can go. Uh, but that would be in Vegas. So it's not like going to a finished goods, um, like Natural Expo. This is something that's actually for manufacturers, so you can learn about the supply side of our business. Um, and then the other thing is that also seems silly, but getting involved in kind of any kind of social media or ambassador opportunities for, for companies, for supplement companies, for yourself, for your business, um, it's another piece that is surprisingly lacking in our demographic of positions that we can utilize and run social media in an effective and legal way. And so any kind of skill like that is gonna lend itself to be really helpful as well. So that's kind of background. How about questions at this point? Otherwise I can just tell you more about what I do here. What about being a student company rep Remember that I, program? I think it definitely can help. We're actually in conversations about how to revamp that program right now. So you might see that happening. At, it would be great to have you back. <laughs> we, we're, we're discussing how to make that look and how it works effectively as a brand and as a way of supporting the naturopathic community. Um, we're we realize that things have changed a lot with Thorne. We've been around for a really long time and change is inevitable. Um, but just creating a better understanding of, of sort of our motivation and the business side aspect of, of changing that relationship and how it affects practitioners and how we can help to educate and, and balance that, which is a, a challenge from our side. But part of our efforts are going to be the student rep or Thorne Ambassador program that we're working on right now. Let's see. No 
questions. So I, I do have a question. Um, Yay. So uh, my name is Derek, uh, second Derek. year here at, at his CNN. Um, my question is, is would you, oh, I just went blank. What was I even thinking? Um, would you recommend as a, going, like if I'm a new grad, going straight into a new school company? Or would you recommend, as you did, going into private practice, getting some experience under you, and then getting in? Or like this culture could becoming a new school rep. Would you recommend that or frown against that? I think that either way could be beneficial. I think whatever makes you grow in confidence and comfort level is what's going to matter the most. It, it does definitely come up for me. Uh, we have doctors, other naturopaths that have been working here for over 25 years. Um, but they sort of took the route of coming here without a lot of clinical practice or they had a really short amount. I think there are some times when my area of expertise is different than theirs because I have a lot more recent clinical practice experience, but I don't think it makes either one of us any better or worse of a contributor to the team. Uh, and I think that whatever works best for you. I would say that if you definitely know you want to be involved in a nutraceutical company position, that it's probably not emotionally healthy to start a private practice and leave it because it's a really, really hard thing to do. It's hard on your patients. It's hard on you. Um, it's kind of like abandoning your baby that you spent a long time building and it's a, a difficult thing to do. It's probably not the most productive choice of your time. Um, but it's okay to change your mind and it's okay to do what makes you happy. You know, your patients are important and affecting their lives is important, but it, your life is important. And you can't function as an effective practitioner unless you're taking care of yourself. Um, so changing your mind is fine. But I think if you know that you want to end up sort of more in a corporate position or a nutraceutical company, it may not be the best utilization of your energy to start a practice and plan to leave it. Um, also, I feel like for me and for a lot of other people that were starting to practice at the same time, it probably took me five years to feel comfortable from a financial standpoint in a private practice. I, I went solo practitioner. I didn't go in a group practice. It just We call it single shingle, just put out a sign and started my own business, which is hard to do. It's super rewarding. It's really exciting. But I think that to, to feel really solidly comfortable, it took five years. Um, so I would want to invest five years of your time and then plan to walk away from it because you're not going to want to do that. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. You're welcome. Just one a follow-up question. Um, in doing like, is there many people that do both? Both a nutraceutical like, rep and also a practitioner, kind of like what we were doing, and is that sustainable? I think that it is from a certain perspective. So one of the doctors that I was telling you about who lends themselves to customer support is is a customer support representative for Thorne and has a full-time practice. So she, she kind of does both. I don't think she would have time to be contributing for like a medical education standpoint, but she's basically handling, she's contracting for us to handle specific medical questions that our customer service team cannot manage or that need to really be coming from a physician. And so she, she sort of has that double goal. We have one position like that in all of Thorne. So I don't think it would be uh, a thing you'd want to plan on because you don't think there's a lot of demand or you know, place for that. I don't know what other companies are doing, but I know that we have one. So I think your odds are not <laughs> super great. Um, I think it would be, if that's something you wanted to do, the best way to start would be contributing pieces. So having written content, uh, on a website, yours, someone else's, that oh, at one point I was getting paid, which you know may or may not seem significant, but I was getting paid 20 cents a word. And I was just doing that as a side project, but 20 cents a word adds up pretty quickly. And if you're an efficient writer, you can make a significant length of a piece in a couple hours, then you're making a decent hourly wage. 
Uh, and I think that's a valuable thing to be doing, even as a student, to contribute some kind of writing content like that. I think that's probably the best way to try to balance both worlds. It also gets you out of that clinical mindset for a little bit to just sort of talk or engage or just feel like you're telling a story, which I found really um, mentally healthy for me to have something else to do with my mind after a day in the office. I'm sure each position with Thorn is different, um, and also where for the home bases for Thorn, and like where would you spend most of your time working? I our home base now. Uh, they moved from Sandpoint, Idaho, last year to uh, it's called Somerville, South Carolina, but we're outside of Charleston, South Carolina. So I, I chose. I came. I moved here from LA, which is a big move for me. So I chose to live in downtown Charleston. So. It's like a 25 minute commute when my LA commute was 90 minutes to go six miles. So <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, a lot of people live in Somerville, but I prefer to live closer to the city. So that's home base for me. Um, travel is variable on position. When you start a job here and you sign your job description, it gives you a specific percentage of travel that should be expected for your position. Uh, so it shouldn't be you know, a big shocker. I, I would say, I think that my job description said 10 to 20%, and right now I'm probably traveling twice a month for three days at a time or so. Uh, so home corporate base is Charleston or Somerville, and then we have some other parts of our administration in New York City. So I've been to New York City for some meetings like that. And then the other part of traveling that I'm doing is for medical education purposes. So we have a relationship with Mayo Clinic. Some traveling happens for meetings with that. Uh, we're create, co-creating content with Mayo, so the, that requires a bit of travel. And then the other times I've been traveling or traveling that is scheduled for me are, I'll be at AANP in Portland. So if anyone's going to that, so if I can say hi. Um, so some medical education events from that standpoint. And then I'm also involved in the retail sales team for Thorne. So um, wherever we're negotiating possible contracts for retail sales for our supplements, I'm going to meet with advisors and procurers and medical directors about why Thorne's different, why it's a better company, and sort of doing education from that standpoint. So that that's really what my travel is about. Um, it's not super stressful. It's nothing that's like fire drill travel, but it's more uh, about being in person, face to face, for medical education purposes. Okay, so um, working for Thorn then would involve relocation to Charleston. It depends on the position. Um, I think anyone we're hiring in medical affairs right now would require location in Charleston. Uh, that doesn't mean it will, won't change, that could change, but as far as how our team is building right now, having people on site is really what we we're going for. It wasn't optional for me to work remote. Uh, it was required that I would be on site and, and I was okay with that, but yeah, I, I would say the opportunity to work for Thorne remotely is going to be small unless you're on the sales force. Can you explain that position in the sales force? I don't know a lot about it, but we do um, we do have a sales team, and we're actually changing how that's built right now. But working on sales team would be having a regional territory. So we have the sales force across the country because they're, they're on site going and visiting doctor's offices to educate, provide information. Um, they're a sales representative for the company. I have no idea what their compensation structure is like, but from from when I came here, all of them were off-site. We're building an on-site team for inside sales and for practitioner support, but we're still gonna have a team of people that are still visiting doctor's offices, so that would be that would be a remote position option. I see, thank you. You're welcome. How about anything else or anyone else? 
So with the, the sales force that you're talking about, is those usually physicians or is it? They're not. Not, okay. Not, not currently. I, I don't know that I could tell you that would be a bad place to, mm -hmm. to be uh, because um, you're talking to physicians, so if you can speak their language, it's really helpful. That's part of what we're doing on my team is to assist the sales force to be able to have a medical conversation or to have a science-based conversation with someone or if a practitioner asks them about a particular product or wants some kind of technical detail, then we're providing that support for them. Essentially, if you were trained as a physician, you wouldn't need me, so you could put me out of a job. I dare you. Don't do it. <laughs> um, but I think it could make sense, and I, I think it, it could make financial sense if you were good at being a salesperson. I would rule it out as a possibility if it's something that you're interested in. How about um, just general questions? But how, what year are you all second year or different? Fourth year. We have different years, different quarters. Okay. Is this a class or? No, this isn't a class. This is a, um, a Get Inspired career series that I put on from noon to oh, okay. one on Tuesdays. So it's just anybody can come in and learn. Okay. And then um, how about just general questions for me? I've kind of been all over the base as far as what your options can be being an MD, what's everybody thinking about doing? Or what's everyone inspired to do? Or anything I can help with there? Do you want to share? Do you know? Um, initially, I would like to travel a little bit or travel to my patients. Like maybe have a home base, but then travel to patients who can't get into the office so easily. OK. Because you want to have a concierge practice from that sort of luxury medicine aspect, or because you're interested in helping people who are incapable of physically visiting your office, or both? Yeah, probably both, but I think probably more so just to help people who can't get into the office. Okay. I've seen a lot of that. I think there's a need for that. I think that if you had the right location, that that could make a lot of sense. Yeah, and if I can do it, we keep you overhead costs. Yeah, so it's like gas and time. That exactly, that becomes a, an account discussion for sure. <laughs> uh, if you do start doing that, it's something I learned probably a couple of years too late. All of those things should be tracked very specifically uh, for tax purposes. So just maybe have a little consult with someone ahead of time. So when you get started, it's all set and ready to go kind of a dance. Um, just ways that you can write off your home office space when you're doing something like that too as a percentage of square footage of your home. Um, as business space, as a tax write-off, all of those things are really helpful. How about anyone else? Anyone else? Of course. Anyone else know what they want to do? How about what are you scared of? Cindy? All right, um, do I push this? You push the, push the, yeah, the green button. On. Okay. All right, hi, my name is Cynthia Hart, and I'm also a student here at SCM. And I want to do adolescent health and more focus in mental health issues with them because I've taught high school science for over 15 years. And so that would be something that, you know, resonates with me. That's pretty much my calling, I believe. And okay. So, how do you, or do you know where, what state you want to be in? Will you be in a licensed or an unlicensed state? I'll probably stay here in Arizona. I've been here for okay. quite some time, so. And do you see that being something that you're going to approach from, like, a homeopathy standpoint, a pharmaceutical standpoint, all of the above, botanicals? Uh, probably more botanicals and energy medicine. Um, okay. Yeah. And you plan to take insurance? Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, you know, there are arguments for both sides of that. I, I do not take insurance. Um, but I think, uh, particularly in that field, 
uh, that it would probably be important to be able to take insurance. Just as a tidbit. I also think that there's not enough of that in general. Um, actually, Dr. Marchese taught me when I was in, in school at ICNF that about uh, such a lack that we have for adolescent medicine where you know we have so much focus on women in menopause and that hormone change, but the hormone change in adolescence is, is just as large, if not a bigger change. Um, and we don't give it nearly the attention that we would give someone going through menopause. And it really like sat in my brain I remember that always, and I tried to remember that when my daughter was an adolescent. <laughs> Maybe I didn't do a great job about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's a really big need for understanding and specialization in that. I, I think that's a really great idea. Yeah, and the one thing that I really want to kind of hone in on is because I know that there is a need, seeing it firsthand as a teacher, I <clears throat> want to do some community based. Outreach where we're giving seminars or webinars where, where they can just come and get information. And then earlier today, John was telling us she could just try to find PTAs to go to and actually speak to the parents to um, get them involved as well. Like, start maybe starting there just to let them know how um, NDs can impact or you know, serve that community. What year are you now? I just finished my first year, so I still have some okay. time to go. <laughs> I think when you get closer, like maybe third year, you should start doing that stuff ahead of time. You don't have to wait until you graduate and have paper in your hand to go talk to a PTA group or reach out. Um, I think the first thing that I thought of as well was, you know, being having exposure for people to feel comfortable, especially in a mental health sort of scenario, is, is finding people to reach on their level. And adolescents are always on social media. I mean, starting an Instagram, or I mean, not even Facebook. I mean, Facebook is for like our parents now, I think. And I'm old, but <laughs> still for my parents. Um, but that's what I would do. I mean, I think, you know, knowing what your audience is and reaching out from a social media standpoint is, is where everything's going. And it wouldn't hurt at all to start your Instagram now about what that is, just so people have a resource and a place to go. Uh, it also gives you something to work on in a project and another piece in your portfolio when it's time to apply for funding or if you're trying to get a business loan that you've been paying attention and you've had a plan the whole time. And, and I think it would be fun. You might learn a lot from that too. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And then just one other thing just came up because yesterday I was, um, I had a doctor's appointment and found out that I'm an empath. And so I don't know. I mean, I, I read some information online about it, but I, I know that I take on other people's stuff. <laughs> and um, just the best way to deal with that, especially with mental health, like, I don't want to take on that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really hard thing to do. I think, um, to be honest, it's something I probably couldn't teach you very well because I didn't do a good job of that myself. Okay. Uh, which is probably what started to wear on me. Uh, and it just depends on where you're at mentally and emotionally. You can think about it from an energetic standpoint, like Chinese medicine. It, in Chinese medicine school, they have, they're have they taught about how to deal with their energy in their own way and, and protecting their chi and harnessing their chi because they're giving it away constantly. So you can think of it from that standpoint. I think downtime and things for your own mental health are important, like meditation, uh, mindful breathing, yoga, whatever it is that sort of rings your bell in that way. And then um, allowing yourself space to just get rid of it because it will build up and it will start to get teased. You have to have an outlet for that, which can be any number of things. Um, healthy outlet, of course. Right. <laughs> um, but, but I think that, you know, making sure you take time to take care of you and to physician heal thyself. We probably forget to do that one a lot. We're so worried about first do no harm that we're doing harm to ourselves. And you know, just making sure you have balance in your life. It, I I personally work about four days a week because if I worked five, it was too much. I, I needed the extra one day to sort of catch up and recharge for myself and sort of decompress from the mental, emotional part. It's a 
it's a hard thing to do. Just make sure that you're giving yourself space to be able to work on that and figure out your tools now. Um, because it will start to happen when you're in the clinic in, in your third year. So <laughs> if I'd been paying more attention, I probably could have worked on it then. So that, I guess that would be my advice. Figure it out early and, and what works for you before it becomes financially dependent on your mental health. Thank you very much. I appreciate your responses. You're welcome. We're nearing our time. We have one question more. Anybody? Okay, go for it. Uh, hi, my name is Amanda. I'm finishing up my first year. Um, my question for you is why the learn? Because you could look for Gaia, you could work for microbiome, so why thorn for you? Um, I mean, I could talk to you about white thorn all day, that's part of my job, but uh, for me personally, what I did was, um, when I was in between positions and I decided, you know, I, I had already left my practice and I, I really wanted to find my my staplet job, my, hopefully my last job, I mean, if for all in, intention that I have, I would like to retire here. And I made a list of all of the companies that I would feel proud to work for because I needed that for myself, for my mental health, and to know that I was doing what was right by my values of wanting to heal people. I'm not saying that Gaia was not on my list. I won't say that, but Gaia was on my list. Uh, and so were a few other places. But so what I did was make my top five and just start reaching out to them. I mean, I wasn't looking for them to have a job post. I was going to them to see what they had. Thorne happened to have had a job post. Um, and it was like someone wrote it for my dream job. As soon as I saw it, I was like, this, this, this is the job. This is the job I wanted. And I expected it to be like a three-month turnaround for them to contact me uh, because that's how everything else was going at that point. And they called me within an hour. And it was just meant to be. I didn't have to work too hard. I didn't even have to contact the other top five on my list because it, it worked out. It was meant to be. But um, I chose them because they've been around for a long time, because I think they represent quality, because I would be proud to work here, and I am. Um, and they have always been a naturopathic doctor focused company facing them, uh, serving the community, serving the schools, the educational institutions, and we they employ us. I don't know if you could even say that lots of other, even nutraceutical companies are applying, uh, are still hiring and utilizing a team of naturopathic doctors and board guys, uh, and we're really proud of that. And so, to me, that it didn't take a lot of choice to make about why Thorn, but it's a, it's a really great place to be. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up because it's close to 1 p.m. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Frick, for taking your time uh, of your busy schedule to talk to our students and listen to them. And let's give another thank you applause. you your evaluations and a big thank you and now I have to figure out how to turn off this <laughs> everybody can feel free to send me an email uh, if you have questions about other things or didn't feel no I was going to ask thank you for reminding me would you be willing to take the students um, questions and comments regarding your position and, and career advice of course for sure. okay I will I will make sure they have your email Okay, sounds good.